And we thank you for coming this evening to hear what the Bible has to say relating to the nation of Egypt. And we might sit here and say, well, what has Egypt got to do with us here in Australia? What has it got to do with me sitting here tonight, listening to this? Why do I really care about what occurs in Egypt? And sadly for most in the world, that's the attitude they take. But what they don't realise is that the events that are occurring and will continue to occur in Egypt are events that the Bible tells us to look for prior to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to establish his kingdom where man has failed. What I hope to show is that the events that have occurred in Egypt over the last 100, maybe 150 years, through to today, very briefly, and then into the future, will have a profound effect on all the earth. Yes, not necessarily the, effect, the, the events that happen in Egypt itself, but the ramifications for that and the fact that the same thing that happens there will ultimately happen throughout the whole earth. It is something that every one of us here should take note of because ultimately it will affect us all. <clears throat> you see, there's two, there's two attitudes we can have to this type of thing. We can look at it and we can say, yes, that's what the scripture says. That's what Bi the Bible says. And I'll look at those things. I'll understand them so that I know what I'm looking for. So that I know the events that will lead to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. So that I won't be deceived when others tell me that it's the Anglo-Americans we should be watching for. As someone tried to tell me yesterday. Or we can put our head in the sand and say, if it's going to happen, it's going to happen anyway and there's nothing we can do about it. You see, that attitude says, I don't really care what God says. I don't really care what the Bible has to say. I'm going to do my own thing and well, the consequences of that, so be it. When we look at what we're going, when we, the things we're going to consider tonight are probably not what most want to hear. You see, most like to hear that, yes, we're going to bring peace on the earth. We'll have a two-state solution in Israel. Uh, the Palestinians and the Israelis will live together. Egypt will come on board, so will Syria, and we'll all live happily ever after. Fairy tales, isn't it, as far as man is concerned? He doesn't have the answer. But what we have here in the Bible is the answer that God gives to those things. But he also gives us the events that will lead to that time when there will be unity. More than peace, there will be true unity on the earth. It's something that Bible students look forward to with anticipation. They look forward to the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth to establish God's kingdom, to do away with the rule of men and establish his kingdom on this earth, a kingdom that will ultimately fill the entire earth. You see, for those who understand the scriptures, when they look at the things that we'll consider this evening, they look at it and see God working in the nations. Not necessarily, well, not God intervening in the nations, but working in the nations to make man do those things that God has said will occur so that ultimately his purpose with this earth will come to pass. When we look at the scriptures and when we look at man, we see that in general the aims of man are poles apart from the aim of what God has with this earth. The leaders of the world do what's good for themselves, don't they? They say we'll have an Arab Spring. They get rid of Mr Gaddafi. So we've now got democracy in Libya. They go into Iraq and we've got democracy there. They go into Afghanistan and we've got democracy there. And today, well, Russia's bringing freedom to Crimea, isn't it? That's not freedom for any of those countries, is it? You see, man has failed in every one of those places where he's tried to do what he saw right, what he saw fit. The same in Egypt. We had the Arab Spring there. Mr Mubarak was gone. One of the Muslim Brotherhood came in. The Saudi Arabians didn't like that, nor did the Israelis. And we've got...
You see, man has done as he pleases there to try and sort the problem out. But what do we have? A bigger mess. Some of what we see going on in Egypt at the moment, as Bible students, we look at and we lift up our heads, for we say it is one step closer to redemption, drawing nigh. While the things we'll look at this evening will result in the death of a lot of people, it is not what God intended. You see, it's the uh, decisions man makes that causes that to occur. The fact that they've decided to turn their back on Almighty God has caused that to occur. You see, 2 Peter 3 and verse 9, we're told the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, would, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to perish, whether it's an Australian or an Egyptian. But if they are not to perish, they are to come to repentance. They are to understand his word and do those things that God requires. Because he won't ink, a wink at ignorance or wickedness as far as he is concerned. You see, being saved is to be on God's terms, not on man's terms. And as the way of man is generally, almost always, opposed to the things of Almighty God, they will not come to repentance. They will not therefore be among they will therefore be among those who perish, as we have here. Throughout the scriptures, God has given us all the proof we need to see that He will perform His work. To see that He will do those things that He said in the Scripture. He says it in Amos 3 and verse 7. The Lord God will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret to his servant the prophets. And what we're going to look at this morning is part of that which he's revealed to his servant the prophets. The, the, what, we, what we're going to consider fall very much into that category. God has told those who will listen what he will do on this earth. Well then, before we look at our subject, let's turn back to Numbers 14 and verse 21. Because this is the ultimate purpose that God is working to with the earth. In Numbers 14 and verse 21, it's one of two great promises God made at this time to the children of Israel. One was that all that were 20 years old and over would die in the wilderness, and that occurred. The second is in Numbers 14, verse 21, where he says, But as truly as I live, it's God speaking, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. There is the purpose of God with this earth, that ultimately it will be all filled with his glory. Elsewhere we're told that it will be filled with his glory as the waters cover the sea. It's telling us that it will be filled with God's glory to the exclusion of of all else. Turn to Zechariah 14 and verse 9 and we look at the fulfilment of this, the ultimate end of it all. Zechariah 14 and verse 9, we read that in that day, the Lord, um, the Lord shall be king over all the earth in that day. There shall be one Lord and his name one. When God's glory fills the earth, he will be king over the earth from one end to the other. There won't be a queen in England and a king in Saudi Arabia and something else. There'll be one king over all the earth. And in verse 16 we read, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of the nations which came up against Jerusalem shall even go from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And it goes on through there to show what will happen to those who don't submit to the king to the Lord Jesus Christ at that time and also show that all will ultimately worship God. What I'm going to try and do this evening from moving forward is to limit my comments to Egypt. Now what probably would have been better is if next week's address had have been tonight because next week's address will basically be about the events that lead to the um, Battle of Armageddon 
But what we're going to talk about tonight is Egypt and really how that will be affected by the Battle of Armageddon and what the outcome will be. So if some of the events I talk about are a bit sketchy, I'd encourage you to come and hear what we have to say next week where those things will be explained in more detail. So what I'd like to do is start our consideration in Daniel chapter 11 as far as Egypt is concerned. And if we were to go through all of Daniel 11, what we'd find is it talks basically about a king of the north and the king of the south. And if we look into those things, we can get an understanding of what it referred to was the dividing of the Grecian Empire in, at the death of the Alexander the Great. And then it goes on to talk, well, that, that empire was divided into four parts. And it goes to talk about the two main parts, the king of the north and the king of the south. And the king of the north was basically uh, located in the area of Turkey and up that re region there. And the king of the south was the one who controlled Egypt. And this was of interest as far as the Bible student is concerned because smack in the middle of it was God's land, the land of Israel. And every time the two of them decided that they wanted to take some of the other's territory, who was sandwiched in the middle? But Israel. So let's con commence our consideration in Daniel 11 and verse 40. Where we read, At the time of the end shall the king of the south push it in, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into, uh, he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. It starts at the time of the end. And in scripture this refers to the period of time at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. So God who knows the end from the beginning has ordained a period of time because he knows what will occur on this earth. He knows what man will do, what it will lead to, and when the time of the end will be. And without going into it, what Daniel 11 verse 40 through to verse 45, I think from memory talks about, is the battle of Armageddon. A battle that will involve Russia, Israel, Christ, Egypt, and every one of us in one way or another. There are events that are going to affect us. It concludes with the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the, to the earth. It speaks of a time of unprecedented world trouble, but it's a time that need not affect you and I if we're prepared to be faithful. And it goes on in chapter 12 and talks about the resurrection and deliverance of the faithful that God invites to be part of his kingdom. And it concludes with the Lord Jesus Christ ruling over the entire earth, an earth, a world at peace. But what we have in this chapter here commences around the time of 1917 with the three players involved. But we have to go back a bit further to that. And in the year 1882, world events saw Britain being forced to intervene in the affairs of Egypt. The British had dominion over the land of Egypt for a period of 72 years. And during this time, Britain was king of the south. And it remained that way until 1956 when circumstances changed and the British troops left Egypt. So the nation that controlled Egypt was the king of the south as far as Daniel 11 is concerned. So Britain was the king of the south. And when she left that title, she relinquished it. So in 1956, Britain left and Egypt was left to be the master of its own destiny, so to speak. We're told that he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries. So what we're being shown here very briefly, explaining it very briefly, is that there'll be one... Sorry, I've skipped a bit here. We'll go on to chapter, uh, verse 42. And it goes on further in time to a time when... A confederacy from the north will invade into the land. And we're told that he shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, <clears throat> and the land of Egypt shall not escape. And what this is talking about, which we'll explain more next week, is a confederacy of nations from the north, Russia and Europe, 
with the Ukraine, with Crimea, invading down through the Middle East, through Israel and into Egypt. And we're told that the land of Egypt shall not escape. You see, the Bible is very careful with its language. When we looked in verse 40, it talked about the king of the south. And if you looked further into this here, the king of the south there was Great Britain. But in verse 42, we're told that the land of Egypt shall not escape. Britain's gone from Egypt at this time. And when that confederacy invades, it will be Egypt that it invades. You see, they will feel the full force of the Russian aggression at this time, who will head that confederacy. Egypt in the past has courted the Russians, haven't they? They went to the west. They had the Arab Spring. They went back to the Russians because they'd give them arms. Where they exactly sit today, I don't know. But something will ultimately happen to cause Russia to invade into Egypt. In verse 43, we're told, But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his step. Now, Egypt's a poor country today. It doesn't have many riches. But it has the riches of old, the things that were found in their pyramids. It has the Suez Canal, a canal that is very attractive to any nation that wants to control the world. And if when Russia contains that, they will restrict world trade like never before. And in verse 44, we're told that tidings out of the north and the east shall trouble him, and he shall therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away. And what we've been shown here is that when Gog or that Russian confederacy invades, there'll be tidings out of the north and the east. Those who oppose him. And the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints, which I hope to show a bit more detail of when we look at Isaiah 19, that will cause them to go forth and they'll destroy the nations that come against them. But ultimately we find that that invading force will be destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. What I've endeavoured to do very briefly and probably not very well is give an outline of what will happen in the Battle of Armageddon, how Egypt will be involved in that, And as I said, I'd encourage you to come next weekend where that will be looked at in far more detail. But what we find is as they go forth, the saints of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord Jesus Christ himself will destroy the Russian host in Egypt. And ultimately Egypt will turn to the Lord Jesus Christ and to the true God because they will see the result of the deliverance that they have been given. So let's turn to Isaiah 19 and have a look at what that has to say. And hopefully I'll fill in a few of the gaps that have probably um, or definitely been left with my very brief run through of Daniel 11. So in verse 1 of Isaiah 19 we read, The burden of Egypt. Behold, the Lord rideth upon a swift cloud and shall come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence and the heart of Egypt shall melt in the midst of it. So what we have here in verse 1 is the end result. We have where the Lord Jesus Christ comes into Egypt. He removes the idols that are there in Egypt and the heart of the Egyptians will melt when they see what is occurring there. You see, it relates to the smiting of Egypt by which they will be healed by which they will be humbled to ultimately accept God and the Lord Jesus Christ, to ultimately accept their neighbours, the Jews. We're told that the Lord rideth on a swift cloud. What this relates to is the saints who will be with him, the immortal beings who will be with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look back at uh, Daniel 11, it aligns with the tidings that will come out of the east. And this will be a detachment of the the saints who with the Lord Jesus Christ will be directed against Egypt. These will come into Egypt, the land of darkness, to reveal the light of God's truth to the Egyptians, to free them from the 
host that is there and oppressing them. They'll come with supernatural power and it will cause them to fear throughout the lands when the Egyptians and ultimately the Russians, the Russian host, realise who's come against them. We're told in that verse that the idols of Egypt will be moved. It would be better translated removed. You know, dumb idols don't shake with fear, do they? But they can be removed and replaced with the true religion. And this is what the Lord Jesus Christ will do to Egypt at that time. He will destroy the false forms of worship that are there and he'll cause the heart of the Egypt to melt with the end result that Egypt will recognise the Lord Jesus Christ and the true God and will worship him and they'll turn to the living God. In verse 2 to 5, Isaiah, having given the, out, the final outcome, returns to the events that will lead to the conversion of Egypt. We have here Egypt under a cruel lord, under that confederacy of nations that comes down, a confederacy that, if you care to look at Ezekiel 38, is described there. But Isaiah gives additional information as to what will occur to Egypt, and Egypt specifically. <coughs> And when we look at Isaiah 19, it refers no doubt to events that are occurring today, but also those that will occur in the future. Look in verse 2. I will set the Egyptians against the Egyptians, and they shall fight everyone against his brother, and everyone against his neighbour, city against city, and kingdom against kingdom. we told here that Egypt will be in a state of civil war at this time. City against city, kingdom against kingdom. And as a result, they'll be in no state to resist the invasion that will occur. Two years ago, what happened in Egypt? We had the Arab Spring there, didn't we? As we mentioned, Mubarak was tossed out, put in prison. They put someone else in. Now someone else is there. What has it done for them? But what we can be sure of is that whatever is going on there at the moment will get worse. It will be city against city, neighbour against neighbour, kingdom against kingdom. In verse 3 of Isaiah 19 we read, The spirit of Egypt shall fail in the midst thereof, and I will destroy the counsel thereof, and they shall seek to idols and to charmers, and to them that have familiar spirits, and to the wizards. It's a nation that is weak and broken. What would civil war do to a nation? There will be no direction for her. None from the politicians. A country that's in a state of civil war, you can hardly expect any direction from their politicians. At that time, Egypt will appeal for help from two directions. The first mentioned is its idols, and the second is those with familiar spirits. The idols of the religion of Egypt, those of Mohammedanism, and Egypt will appeal to its Muslim brothers. But it will be in vain because they also will be in that time of trouble. They'll be involved in war at this time and they'll have no inclination to come and help Egypt. They'll appeal to the charmers, those of the Christian world, Mr Obama maybe. Come and help us like he has. But they'll be preoccupied with their own problems. You see, they'll be worried about what's happening in the Middle East elsewhere or maybe fighting some other war somewhere. And they won't come to Egypt's aid. In verse 4 we read, And the Egyptians shall go over into the land sorry, and the Egyptians will I give over into the hand of a cruel lord, and a fierce king shall rule over them, saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. That fierce king will be Russia and its confederacy. And we know what that nation is capable of. You've only had to have a look at a few things that they've done in Chechnya. No doubt will happen in Crimea. Um, it's probably happened in Georgia. They don't muck around. They're a cruel people. If they don't want you, you're gone. These will occupy Egypt fully 
until tidings out of the north and the east trouble them. Those things we have read about in Daniel 11 and verse 44. And they'll go forth. Part of that force will go forth to fight against the nations and also the, the tidings that come out of the east. In verse 5 to 10, we read, And the waters shall fail from the sea, and the river shall be wasted and dried up. And they shall turn the rivers far away, and the brooks of defence shall be emptied and dried up. The reeds and flags shall wither. The paper reeds by the brooks, by the mouth of the brooks, and everything sown by the brooks shall wither, shall wither, be driven away, and be no more. The fishes also shall mourn, and all that cast angle into the brooks shall lament. They that spread nets upon the waters shall languish. Moreover, they that work in fine flax, and they that weave networks, shall be confounded. And they shall be broken in the, process, in the purposes thereof, all that make sluices and ponds for fish. What this describes is a time of absolute despair as far as Egypt is concerned. There will be total economic collapse, severe depression. As the conditions described in this passage are felt, commerce will cease in verse 5. Egypt will be isolated from help and her canals, possibly the Nile, will silt up, causing poverty to become acute. The fields will be left uncultivated. If there's no water there, you can't cultivate them. There'll be no, it possibly indicates there'll be no water in the, not in the Nile for the crops of Egypt. Blow up the Aswan Dam, as they may well do, and this could quite well occur as the water from that flows down and destroys everything. Fishing will go into decline, verse 8. Industry will close down and cease, verse 9. All will be affected equally at this time in Egypt, both the rich and the poor. With the ultimate result that Egypt will be totally humbled and prepared for the intervention of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will ultimately deliver Egypt from the oppression that they feel, from a desperate plight for which they have no way out of. In verses 11 to 15, we have outlined Egypt's political folly. You know, the prophet mocks the rulers of Egypt. He mocks their reliance on the so-called wise of Egypt who have been unable to help them and deliver them from the invader. Verse 11. Surely the princes of Zoan are fools. The counsel of the wise of Pharaoh is become brutish. How say ye unto Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings? Where are they? Where are thy wise men? And let them tell thee now. And let them know that the Lord of what the Lord of hosts hath purposed upon Egypt. The princes of Zoan are become fools. The princes of Noth are deceived. They have also seduced Egypt, even they that stay of the tribes thereof. The prophecy questions where the right wise rulers have gone. There was the rulers of the past who with their wisdom made Egypt a great nation. A great nation. We know, we've no doubt heard of, heard of what Egypt was like at different stages through history. But what we're told here is their rulers become foolish and irrational. They make decisions that are stupid. And can't we see that occurring today, in Egypt in particular? It's not limited to Egypt, is it? The rulers look to their own interests. They don't care for the population as a whole. And when we see the recent events that have occurred in Egypt, isn't that what's happened? Egypt's a third world nation with a population that no doubt sees no hope for them coming from their rulers. And isn't that what happened? When Mubarak was removed, won't this be great? We've got this new ruler. And within 12, 18 months, I think it was, he was gone. He's not going to help us. And the one that's there now won't do any better. In verse 14 and 15, we read, The Lord hath mingled a perverse spirit in the midst thereof. They have caused Egypt to err in every work thereof, as a drunken man staggereth in his vomit. 
Neither shall there be any work for Egypt which the head or tail, branch or rush may do. Egypt's once felt the wrath of Almighty God when he brought the children of Israel out of Egypt many years ago. Under Moses they had the ten plagues and when they left, Egypt was a ruined nation. On that occasion, they did not learn to fear God. But at this time it will be different. Sorry, at, at this time it will be no different because the rulers that are there won't be guided by Almighty God. They'll look to their own purposes. You see, the nation of Egypt has seen the revival of Israel, but they've not wanted to accept it, have they? They've tried on several occasions to get rid of them. The rulers haven't seen this as the work of Almighty God bringing his purpose to pass. Rather, they've staggered at it like drunken men, trying to solve a problem that they don't know the answer to. God, the prophet tells us, will mingle a spirit, a perverse spirit in that nation, one that will pervade the rulers and seduce the nation to bring it to total ruin. This will cause this nation to stagger like drunken men. You see, events will be put in front of those rulers of that nation and has been over time and does is for every nation to see what decision they will make. And they will make decisions that cause the things that we have read, uh, read here to come to pass. And as a result of this, Scripture tells us that all classes in Egypt will be affected. And what we see is economic depression and unemployment will go higher and higher with increasing severity. And we know what that breeds in a nation, don't we? Especially in these type of nations. In verse 16 to 25, Scripture describes the healing of Egypt or the converting of Egypt to the ways of Almighty God. You see, at the moment, spiritually it is sick. It doesn't understand the things of Almighty God. But when these events occur, they will be healed. They will come to see who Almighty God is, who the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and that he is the God of the Jews. They today hate. Having tasted that extreme hum humiliation that will be brought upon the nation, Egypt will be ready for a saviour. For a saviour who can come and save them out of that cruel Lord that is ruling over them. And it will turn them in ultimately into a God-fearing nation rather than one that is superstitious and worships idols. In verse 16 and 17, we read of Egypt fully humbled. And we read there that Egypt shall be like unto women, and it shall be afraid and fear because of the shaking of the hand of the Lord of hosts, which he shaketh over it. And the land of Judah shall be a terror unto Egypt. Everyone that maketh mention thereof shall be afraid in him because of the counsel of the Lord of hosts, which he hath determined against it. What we show in here is the fear that Egypt will feel when the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the Lord Jesus Christ, at the head of the army of Almighty God, comes against Egypt. He's depicted here as shaking his hand against Egypt. And it will be a threatening and warning attitude that will ultimately go to all nations of the world, Egypt included. And they'll be told to submit to the ways of Almighty God. What they'll be told is these words in Revelation verse 14 and verse 7 where they say, we're told, Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. If you said that to an Egyptian today, what would he do? I don't think you'd want to say it in the middle of Cairo. Fear the God of Israel you probably wouldn't get out alive. But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes against them, he's going to be there with a threatening hand over them and say, fear God and give him glory, for the hour of his judgment is come. This is what you are to do, or else. That, that declaration will be given to all nations, but also to Egypt. And they'll have the choice to submit, politically, 
and spiritually or be compelled to feel the force, to feel the might of Almighty God. No doubt the Russian forces there also will be told that, but they won't listen. Look what we've done, they will say. They will be destroyed. They will be done away with. And Egypt will see their deliverance. The Lord Jesus Christ with the saints will come against that host, that northern host, and will destroy them. And when Egypt sees who has come against them, who has destroyed them and who has saved them, they will fear. Why will they fear? Here is the king of the Jews who has saved them. The king of the Jews, the Jews who they have oppressed. And they'll recall their anti-Semitic carry-on. And they will fear. They'll fear retribution. And the land of Judah, we're told, will be a a terror to Egypt at this time. When they realise that it's the king of the Jews who has saved them. Who's come against them? In verse 18 we read, In that day shall five cities in the land of Egypt speak the language of Canaan and swear to the Lord of hosts, one shall be called the city of destruction. The cities of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan. They'll speak Hebrew. They'll be given a pure language. Zephaniah describes this for us in Zephaniah 3 and verse 9. It It tells us that the entire languages of the earth will become a pure language. It will become Hebrew. Egyptians, the Arabs, Australians in that day will speak that pure language. And we're told that one city will be called the city of destruction. What this most likely refers to is a memorial that's set up to commemorate the overthrow of Russia in Egypt. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ comes down there with his saints and he says to Russia, submit or else, no, he will destroy them. And what this city of destruction most likely points forward to is a memorial city that we set up with the destroyed of that host. And in time after that, when they see that, they will say, that is what happens to those who rebel. Those, that is what happens to those who will not submit to the ways of Almighty God. It will be a memorial to the Egyptians to remind them of what they were under, what rebellion will bring, but also what the things of Almighty God can do for them, how they were delivered out of that hand of a cruel Lord. In verse 19 and 20 we read, In that day there shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. And it shall be for a sign and for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressors, and he shall send them a saviour and a great one, and he shall deliver them. These are permanent memorials that will be set up in the land to bring Almighty God to their attention always, to remind them what God has done for them, and to encourage them not to return to their former ways. It will be set up also to remind the Egyptians that they need to go to the house of God, to the house of the king of the Jews, to the house of the God of Israel at Jerusalem. And they will go from year to year. It will be set there to remind them what God did for them and make them recall the intervention of the Lord Jesus Christ as their saviour from that cruel law. If we went back to Exodus and read the account of the children of Israel in Egypt, we find that the, the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the persecution that the Egyptians gave them. And in this day we're told that they will cry to the Lord. The Egyptians will cry to the Lord because of the oppression that is there. Won't the tables turn? The Lord Jesus Christ will teach them of God's ways and direct them in the things of Almighty God. Psalm 22, verse 27 and 28. We read that all the ends of the earth shall remember and turn unto the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he is the governor among the nations. 
all the world, not only Egypt, will turn unto the Lord. And all the kindreds of the nations will worship him. How many nations in its entirety worship God today? I'd suggest none. In actual fact, there is none. But in that day, that's what will happen. Yes, what we've got here is the events that will make Egypt realise that. Next week, you'll hear of the events that will make the rest of the world realise who God is. In verse uh, 21 to 22, we have the final conversion of Egypt. We told the Lord shall be known in Egypt and the Egyptians shall know the Lord in that day and do sacrifice and oblation. Yea, they shall vow a vow unto the Lord and perform it. And the Lord shall smite Egypt. He shall smite and heal it. And they shall return even to the Lord and he shall be entreated of them and shall heal them. When the kingdom of God is fully established, the nation of Egypt will return or turn as it, to God as it should better be rendered. The Egyptian will know who God is and will worship him in the way God desires. As we said before, when Moses took Israel out of Egypt, God said to Moses, I'm going to make Israel know who God is. Pharaoh said to Moses, Who is God that I should obey him? Egypt learned who God was, but they didn't obey him. In this day, they're going to learn who God is, but they will obey him. They will learn to obey Almighty God. They will learn to worship God as they should. In verse 23, we read, In that day there shall be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrian shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptian shall serve with the Assyrian. Egypt in that day will form part of a united world under the Lord Jesus Christ who will rule over the entire earth as king on God's behalf. It will extend to the four corners of the globe. What we have here in verse 23 is that time when righteousness will be established in the entire earth, when righteousness will be established by the Lord Jesus Christ in Egypt. In the days of Isaiah, Egypt and Assyria were the two dominant powers and they came against each other, no doubt. But at this time, they will be as one. The righteous things of the Lord Jesus Christ will govern both nations. The two factions will be disciplined and they'll be converted and healed by the Lord Jesus Christ so that they will ultimately follow the way of righteousness. At this day, in this day, they'll follow one path, the path of righteousness, and therefore they will be one. God's truth, the highway of righteousness, will unify all nations. In verse 24 and 25 we read, In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of mine hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. These nations will be forced to recognise the status of Israel in the plan of purpose of Almighty God. They'll learn that it's the God of Israel, the God of the Jews, and they'll desire to be with them Though at this time Israel will also be healed. They'll be brought to understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is. They will accept him as their king and God as their God. The final blessing that's outlined here in this prophecy of the latter day Assyria and Egypt, they will be blessed in terms that were previously reserved for Israel. Blessed are my people Egypt. Now a converted nation. And Assyria, the work of mine hands, a transformed people to to the ways of Almighty God. But Israel will still remain God's inheritance. We thank you for your time here this evening to hear what will happen to Egypt in the future. The sad things that will happen to them in the short term with the glorious future that awaits them beyond that. 
and what it will take to make them see who the Lord Jesus Christ is, who the God of the true God is, and to accept him. The troubles Egypt will go through will bring them to that realisation, will bring them to see who God is, to accept him and the Lord Jesus Christ, so that they can be part of that glorious future that God has with this earth. But it's not only a future for Egypt. It's a future for every man, woman and child on this earth who's prepared to look into the things of Almighty God, who's prepared to look at the things that God has recorded in Scripture, to understand them and to do with that which God requires of man so that in the day when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, he may be found waiting and prepared for the kingdom that he will establish on this earth and that, that they may be set, that the Lord Jesus Christ may say to them, inherit the kingdom prepared for, for you. We thank you for your time.